Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Let us begin our Dharma talk with the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times. Om Nam. 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 Thank you very much. Tonight we talk about emptiness and abundance, two concepts that seem to be in contradiction, yet they are not. Let me recall an old Zen story from China, where it was very customary for learned men, like professors of this day, to visit Zen masters and have a conversation with them. So an academic person visited a great Zen master and uh, they were having tea. And so it is that the host always serves the guest. The Zen master was pouring tea into the cup of the professor. And he didn't stop. It was just pouring, pouring over onto the tray. And the professor took notice and said, Hey, it's too full. You can't put any more in there. Then the Zen master said, Just like your mind. And that's why we need to talk about emptiness a little bit, which is not the lack of information, rather what we call mind space. So if you have enough mind space, you are receptive enough. You are open enough. You are sharp enough. If your mind space is filled up with thinking, feelings, lots of dualistic notions, and it's broken up to past, present, future, then your mind is full. You really cannot see clearly, hear clearly, let alone think or feel clearly. And in Zen, when we practice don't know mind, it's really the mind beyond any dualities, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that's why the more empty you got, the more abundant life gets. Because we have everything, we just don't notice it. And once your mind is sufficiently spacious and clear and present, then you can really perceive everything and attain everything. So Zen is not special. I'm very happy to be here in the ordinary Zen Sangha. So thank you for having me here. I can tell you that ordinary is not ordinary. Simple and clear has nothing missing. Simplicity and clarity bring you the ultimate qualities of life and death, which we as humans do not experience so many times. Because we are too full with ourselves. We are too full with our sensory perceptions. We attach to things so much. We hold on to our memories even when we don't need them. We make things up in our mind, even when there is no creative process necessary. So the more we can control our own consciousness, the better persons we become. And that control is not this iron fist police style control. It's something that begins with awareness. Something that you realize as your own basic potential, that we can all do this. In Zen, we call that Buddha nature. In fact, all Mahayana Buddhism uses Buddha nature as our potential of awakening. 
Now this all sounds very good, like Santa Claus giving you little cookies or gifts. But it's not really like that. If you go deeper, the notion of Buddha nature gives you a huge responsibility. Because it also implies that no one can wake up instead of you. No one can have this clear mind space instead of you. We have to do it ourselves. In that endeavor, we are not alone, but we are on our own. And that's why it's wonderful to practice together. It's wonderful to experience the Dharma, which is actually older than 2,500 years. Buddha Shakyamuni talks about many Buddhas before him and many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas after him. It is our potential to be one of them. We can rise to that level. If we practice diligently and well enough, then we can leave our karma behind, experience oneness and clarity, and that's when the abundance of life can actually reach us. Before that, we don't even see it, although it's right in front of us. Another Zen master was asked, what is the great teaching of the Buddhas and patriarchs? He said, right in front of you. The students still didn't understand. What do you mean by this? The Zen master said, right in front of you. Is there anything else besides this teaching that I should master and understand? And the Zen master said, right in front of you. So please, don't lose this moment. If you keep this moment clear, everything is clear. If you lose this moment, you lose pretty much everything. And the good news is we do not have to lose this moment. We can become clear, we can become present, and we can be there for each other. This is the best part. We humans, in our individuality, can feel so isolated at times. That we are alone. We are never alone. We are always connected to something, someone. But if our minds are too full, we never realize that connectedness, that original oneness. Then how can we trust another being? How can we have real heart-to-heart -heart relationship to another being? So emptiness is very important. You're not missing anything. You have just done some house cleaning. That's all. And if you want true abundance, then focus on that which does not appear or disappear. That does not come or go. And then you have done a great service to yourself, to your family, to your spouse, and to the rest of humanity. Okay? And now I would like to welcome your questions. Hi, yes. thank you for being here. Uh, you just said to concentrate on the abundance and also in the things that are not going to disappear. What would be those things? Actually, if it's a thing, then it appears and disappears. And I said focus on emptiness so that you would have the abundance. And that part cannot be skipped. That's something we must go through. Attaining emptiness sounds scary, because where are you in there? Well, the good news is, originally your self-image never existed, and you don't need it. You need your true nature. You need your true self, in order that your personality would operate well. But you don't need a self-image or any kind of idea about yourself, because if we become attached to that idea, we become very egotistical. So, emptiness first or don't know mind first, and then abundance happens. It's not something that you get in a box. It's something you realize, okay? So things, names and forms, mental images, notions, they appear and disappear. But there's something that sees all this, attains all this, that doesn't appear or disappear. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you be so kind to go over the four precepts of Zen again, please? All right. I think you refer to the four principles of Zen, which is uh, really significant of our lineage. And uh, it has been in the making for the last 15, 1700 years. And it was Bodhidharma himself about 1500 years ago 
that put his mind seal on it. That's why they attribute the following four principles to him, although it had been in existence way before him. The first, do not depend on the scriptures. That's where we transcend anything religious, scientific, orthodox, whatever used to be, the established knowledge. Orthos and doxa, established knowledge. When we rely on only that, we become limited. We do not attain the source, we deal with the product. In order to focus on human mind directly, which is the second principle of Zen, we have to leave our cognitive comfort zone behind. That's why we do not depend on the scriptures. We read them, we understand them, we master them, we use them if necessary, but in our spiritual quest, we do not depend on them. The second, directly pointing to human mind. As I have said, this would be impossible without the first. We would be limited by filters, concepts, boundaries, preconditions, presuppositions. And directly pointing to human mind is just one question. What is this? What is this that sees with your eyes, hears with your ears, feels with your heart, thinks with your mind, and most importantly, says I at the beginning of a sentence. The third, awakening equals attaining your true self or true nature. We have a lot of theological concepts of God in the West. And likewise, in the Orient, there are tons of concepts of enlightenment. What enlightenment is, what enlightenment is not. And Zen makes it super simple if it's capability, some kind of karma, some appearance that will disappear, it's not what we talk about. It's at best a byproduct of your practice and you shouldn't get lost in it. Awakening means you attain our true nature. Our, as a word, is deliberate. In fact, it's the only thing that is really common in all of us. We all have different bodies, different minds, different sensations. What we really share as our human nature is our true self, our potential for awakening. The little Buddha inside, okay, if you want to be romantic. And that's why everything else is just karma. And the fourth transmission from mind to mind. It's impossible to give this as a gift to someone. It's an enlightenment package. Now you got it because you opened it. If it gets delivered to your door, return it, okay? Don't open. <laughs> so mind-to-mind -mind transmission means you have to practice together with your teacher, with the Sangha, and then something that I cannot really describe with words happens. And then there's a mutual recognition. When that happens, you understand why you follow your teacher. And then the teacher really understands that, okay, now you know what I'm teaching you. And in Zen, of course, we have uh, the trial and test of your clarity, the paradoxical stories with questions and answers called kongans. And they show how clear and functional your mind is. So if you follow the four principles of Zen as much as they can be followed, and you practice clarity, as much as you possibly can do that, then sooner or later your intuition gets sharper. And then you can find a needle in the haystack. And you see a kongan, it's like a huge haystack, and your teacher tells you, okay, find a needle in there. And of course, if it's shiny and metal, you can, okay, this is it, small haystack. And kongans get more difficult. Then the needle begins to look like a piece of hay. And the haystack is huge. So you can't find it just by looking, by fumbling around with your intellect and just being smart. Then your potential, then your don't know, has to be strong enough, like a magnet above the haystack, which just, boom, attracts the needle. That's how you know that it's the needle and not the rest of the haystack. That's how intuition works. It's very different from the usual cognitive or emotional intelligence, which we love and we should have. 
but intuition is something else. It's the function of your true nature, moment to moment, clearly, compassionately, and wisely. The foundation of that is this non-dualistic attainment, which we mentioned at the beginning, the emptiness and abundance together. In fact, shunyata, the original Sanskrit term, means empty completeness or complete emptiness. So it's not void. It's not something where you miss a lot, okay? What is most important that the four principles of Zen and Kongan practice points at something which we all have, but that doesn't have any name or form relevant to it. We have been making names and forms to designate that for thousands of years. But the moment we open our mouth to say it, it's false. The moment we make some shape to describe it or designate it, it's 84,000 miles away from the actual truth. You can see some references to this in mainstream religions, like don't make an image of God, okay? In Zen, uh, we say, if you meet Buddha, kill Buddha. Same point. That's why the four principles of Zen are the four corners of the gate to liberation. If we didn't have it, we really couldn't attain our true nature. Uh, profiting that you are uh, talking about the four principles of Zen, if you could explain and come back to what is the relation with the four noble truths and how they inter Thank you. Wonderful relate question. together. Thank you. You know, the four noble truths, uh, they're about a thousand years older than the four principles of Zen. That's what Shakyamuni Buddha formulated as his first structural teaching. Legend has it that when he attained full, complete, and unexcelled enlightenment, then he saw that if we want to truly understand the nature of this world, then we should perceive it as created by mind alone. You can read about this in the Avatamsaka Sutra, along with all the commentaries and everything, which is like 600 pages just about one sentence, to rub it in, okay? This shows how difficult that must have been 2,500 years ago. This was revolutionary. Imagine the Hindu pantheon, the Hindu worldview, which is still prevalent today, okay? None of the Vedanta would talk about this, that it would come back to the human mind, that the Atma Brahma never incarnates originally, you have no self, etc., this was revolutionary. And he saw that as one sentence, as one step from zero to 100%, people don't get it. It's too simple. So he broke it up into four. The fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. We have to have some foothold in this reality in order to realize this, which is really not abstract, but it's really beyond human cognition, this one point. So the fact of suffering is that we want things that we love to last, but they don't last. They are impermanent. We want our relationships to be perfect, but we are dependent on also people that we don't like. Okay. And we are imperfect, although we want to be. We want others to be perfect, and guess what? They are not. So impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection, they are the cause of suffering because we want things that are impossible. This human construct, body and mind together, is so interesting that we seem to be on Earth because we were born, and we use this exoskeleton called human body, but the mind it's not really compatible with this around us. So the fact of suffering that we are born, we get old, we get sick, we die, it's undeniable. And he had to begin with something truly simple, clear, undeniable, right at hand as a gateway to further teaching. The four smaller kinds of suffering is being in the company of those that you dislike, not being in the company of those that you like, getting things you don't want, and not getting things you want, the four smaller kinds of suffering. 
The cause is really clear. As I've mentioned, impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection, we all face that. It's also pretty much undeniable. And then the end of suffering is a really going beyond all this, going beyond all dualities, not being identified with the sense realms. And that's when we come ultimately to our mind. And the way to end suffering is just practicing, attaining this non-dualistic state of mind. So in four steps, it seems to be easier. And it is. That's how hundreds of millions of people could attain the Dharma and still practice it today. But the four principles of Zen, a thousand years after Shakyamuni Buddha or so, gave another boost to it. Just like 2,500 years ago, the Four Noble Truths took people out of their comfort zone, their established knowledge, their fixed worldview and self-image. To that extent, 1,500 years ago, the Four Principles of Zen took Buddhists out of their comfort zone and established a new view, a more radical view. And to put that into perspective, I can recall Bodhidharma's interaction with Emperor Wu as uh, he landed in China after like two years of boat ride from India to China. He stopped in many places and he learned Chinese, okay? And by the time he reached Emperor Wu's court, uh, he spoke Chinese. His fame and reputation preceded him. And Emperor Wu, of course, tested him, tested his mind. And he said, I have built countless temples. I have supported countless monks. How much merit did I gain? And this test refers back to the Lotus Sutra, where you can also read the Four Noble Truths, that if you do the right thing, it brings you good results. We call that merit. But what if he had done countless good things and he supported countless people? So what's the result of that? So in modern physics and mathematics, we say infinities corrupt the equation. So he tested Bodhidharma's mind with infinity in the equation. And Bodhidharma went back to this word, no merit. Go back to zero. Probably Emperor Wu looked at him like you are looking at me right now with eyes wide open. What? What was that about? So he had his second salvo and he asked, and what is the meaning of the Holy Scriptures? I.e., if the sutras say so, why don't you refer to that? And Bodhidharma says, no holiness, only vast empty space. Then the last try by Emperor Wu, he asks, then who is standing in front of me? And Bodhidharma says, don't know. Literally, Wu Shun, no mind, no thinking, don't know, no self. Because Shin or Shim, in Korean Shim, means the heart and the mind and the individual together. Okay? Then the emperor says, I find nothing common between us, you may leave. So Bodhidharma just turned around, walked north, crossed the Yangtze River, and sat in Shaolin in a cave for nine years, turning towards the wall. Then he became revered and famous enough that in the tenth year his first disciple appeared and he started to teach. So that's how our true nature can operate at a very high level. Now, nobody expects you to sit in your home nine years facing the wall. Please don't do that. And don't lock yourself in your bathroom, okay? So the point is that when you really attain this don't know, this emptiness that we started with, then the abundance that appears, the richness of the world that appears, is beyond description. This is not an empty promise. Just look at your own mind, how you see your environment when you're happy, what comes to you, and how you see your environment, what reaches you when you're sad, or angry, or upset. Try your filters, and your filters will teach you. Now imagine no filters. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? More questions? I wanted to get back to koan practice. And uh, speaking of abundance and uh, living in fear 
in life and fear being a big motivator in how we run our lives. Alienation. And then we come to practice. We get offered an opportunity to sit with some crazy Zen master that in a, in a, in a room by ourselves and do koan practice, which we're going to do this weekend. So how can we feel safe in that environment? You can't. <laughs> Especially you. Because you know what you're talking about. Somebody totally fresh coming in here, Sunim, I would like to practice going on wonderful. Please take a seat, have some tea. We give you instructions. You only get 30 hits. That's it. No safety. So this moment is our only safety. This presence is the only thing we've got. And with Kongan practice, your mind goes naked. Your mind does. Because you have to take off all the artifice, everything like a self-defense or the established view, and then penetrate to the heart of the matter. The paradox strips you totally naked mentally. Every single inch of your karma shows. And if you're afraid of that, then you're afraid of yourself. And Kongan practice really teaches you to be fearless. Once you get through, you will love it. Before that, ah, strange. The guy is bold. Eh, I don't like it. So, so we have all kinds of excuses. Fantastic. You can attach to them. You can hold on to them. You can identify with them. And as time runs out and your suffering grows and your irritation persists, and something flips over. We wait for that. We don't make it faster or slower. Your own suffering can teach you if the Dharma cannot. That's why Zen doesn't convert anybody, because there's nothing to convert to. Either you choose to follow the way out of your own will, or it's not genuine, it's not authentic. So if any fear or resentment controls you, no problem. You should remember that you always have a choice. Do you want your fear, your resentment, your self-defense controlling you? If yes, no problem. Keep your defensive posture. Nobody will invade. In fact, only very close students get hit by the Zen stick. Beginners, no. You have to earn it. <laughs> More questions? Can you talk about the skandhas? You know, and yeah, like the five skandhas. Yeah, uh, it's at the beginning of the Heart Sutra. Let me quote it for the public. The sentence goes like this: Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when practicing the deep transcendental wisdom, i.e., Prajna Paramita, perceives that all five skandhas are empty, and thus transcends all suffering. Please think of the skandhas as the five building blocks of your favorite toy. So your toy needs a body. That's what they call form. It has to have input and output. It's called feelings. The result of this input and output is perceptions. The outcome of perceptions as you react to it is impulse. And the whole thing reflected in your individual mind is consciousness. Form, feeling, Perception, impulses, consciousness. The five ingredients that make up this toy called human being, sentient being. And then, think about the campfire. You have five pieces of logs. The fire is burning because the logs are together. If you put them really close together, and the fire is tall, it's very bright. If you pull them apart, the fire is lower and fainter. If you pull them completely apart, the fire dies. So what holds the body, the feelings, the perception, the impulses, and this consciousness together? What is that? And the Sutra teaches us that originally these do not exist. Originally these do not have to meet i.e. our existence is conditioned and not predetermined. 
So if you make something, you have it. If you don't make something, you don't have it. If you put the five skandhas together and you build up this toy, then you have a toy. If you don't build it up, then you don't have it. And that's why it's called the heart of the wisdom, the transcendental wisdom that we strive to attain. Reverse it. If you want to transcend suffering, then you have to see where it comes from. It comes from body and mind. You put body and mind together, you have a suffering sentient being. You do not put the five skandhas together, you do not have suffering, because the sentient being doesn't arise, doesn't come about. It goes back to this first teaching from the Avatamsaka Sutra that I quoted. If it's created by ourselves, it exists. If we don't create it, it doesn't exist. And that's why the sentence, originally the five skandhas are empty, is so important. That's liberation coded. Okay? We in our daily lives here, we need a body and a mind. We need our feelings, perceptions, impulses, and we need our consciousness. The question is, how do we use it? What is the direction, the purpose of our lives? Because that's why we put the five ingredients together. That's why we burn this campfire. That's why we put the logs together. And when we practice, we see that originally they don't exist. We put them together. We created the whole construct. All right? And that's why when we practice correctly, we return to the mind which is before existence, which is before life and death. And then we see how it's created by ourselves. It's a fascinating process. Okay, and the sutra reminds us right away that we are not identifiable with any of the five skandhas. We think we are our bodies. We are not. We use it. We think we are our feelings. We are not. We create it. We think we are our consciousness, our cognition. No, we run it. Okay? That's why we usually say in common language, when you come in and you want to do a retreat, you really have to unplug yourself. <laughs> okay? Then you attain. I feel like I am suffering. I am uh, in a trap of my own making. I'm referring to um, my home situation. Uh, I've been caregiving for my wife who's ill. And so uh, on the one hand, I feel like uh, this is my responsibility, which I assumed uh, a long time ago. And I'm glad to be able to, to uh, help her. But on the other hand, uh, I feel like I've been um, abused and uh, criticized, and uh, um, I, I'm I'm hurt, and yet I feel like I cannot walk away from this situation, uh, and I'm trying to use my practice to uh, resolve this uh, in such a way as to uh, maintain my balance, uh, my peace of mind, and uh, I'm failing. You identify two roles, and that's the problem. Husband and caregiver. There's an overlap, but they're not the same. As long as it's the same for you, you don't think about getting professional help. So the caregiver can be multiplied. You can invite some help from the outside. You can hire someone. But the husband, that's only you. No one else is her husband, but you're not the only person who can be the caregiver, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. You said there was the four noble truths, and then a thousand years later there were the four principles of Zen. Correct. And that there hasn't been any really a need to add to that since then. No further updates necessary. It seems to me, and I want your opinion on this, I was thinking about it, there's a, a concept that's come along that helps us, that there's a word, the concept that we use all the time to help us understand the nature of what's going on, which I think is helpful. I wonder where it fits into the pantheon. The word is ego. Well, uh, we have to attribute that a uh, lot of Western psychologists, but it actually was created by a biblical translation. Ego sum via veritas et vita. So I am the way, the truth, and life. 
and this ego, that's when it came to the fruit. What is that? I mean, people started to identify themselves with this ego and they got burned real severely. We don't go into the correctness or incorrectness of that translation. But the word ego came to us in European civilization at that time as something supremely important. And instead of asking what this I is, we took it for granted. We took it as predefined. And we had the wrong relationship to it. Instead of asking who are we, this great I, which is the way, truth, and correct function or correct life, and us, are we the same or different? If we are different, what is the distance? How can we cover that distance? In fact, the notion of self has been around as a question for thousands of years, way before the Abrahamite religions appeared. In India, in China, they had been dealing with that way before. And they got different answers. Practice offers us a way of experiencing and attainment. And the way we are in the West, with the mainstream religions, the only way is faith, believing. Two very different paths. And each one of them can give us the right experience. Each one, yeah, they can meet, but they can only meet in the heart. Each one of them is fraught with dangers and pitfalls, and each one of them can render the right results if we are sincere about it. But the question of I, the ego, in the West came really with monotheistic religions. And then, Add a few hundred years, and we had to redefine the I from a very secular perspective, and that's when psychology came. It's a process we have to internalize, and we have to work on ourselves and find out who we truly are instead of what we think we are. Because if you suffer a lot, then there's a lot of illusion about yourself that you entertain, which is not true. That's why we have to drop what we think we are. And if we become empty of that, we become free from that, then comes the abundance, who we truly are. But we don't see it before we get rid of the first. I don't think that this question will ever go obsolete. If you find someone really positive and fantastic, say, who is this? Wow, it's wonderful. When you find somebody totally obnoxious, it's who is this? Oh man, how is this possible that this being even exists? Where does instinct come from? Freud. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're welcome. So we say unfinished karma or an archetypal reality. That's a Jungian term. Uh, anything that is kind of under the surface what I need us to understand is that this instinct concept is also instinctual. It's not really worked out well. To the present day, post Freudian people, they are working on it to make this very, very clear how this can form part of a psychological universe, a worldview or a concept of the human being that is workable, that is functional. I prefer to call it unprocessed karma. That strikes when you don't look. That's instinct. Yeah, yeah, when you don't look. It can be even the most positive instinct. Don't think of bad, you know, as the so, kind of monkey in the background. Imagine the mind like a circle. Mm -hmm. The top 10% is your conscious self that you know. 90% beneath that is your ocean of subconscious. But it's loaded with fish. Sometimes the fish jump and they penetrate the threshold and they come up and then they jump back. And uh, that's when instincts can become uh, drivers. That's when external phenomena or situation can invoke something from inside. And what is important is to keep this threshold very clear. Moment to moment, what is it that you allow from your subconscious to manifest? And how long do you keep it in your consciousness before you let it sink back to your subconscious ocean? So it's not that you have to make everything conscious from your little 90% inside because we would go nuts. It's not necessary. What is necessary that this 
threshold, this trap door, would open and close flawlessly thousands of times a second. Okay? What is it that you let go? What is it that you keep? What is it that remains conscious? What is it that goes back to seemingly oblivion? You don't forget it really, you just don't use it. So instinct is something that they use from the 60s. I feel it's a little bit of an isolated concept, unnecessarily mysterious. And if you look at the mind as a mini universe, of course instincts have their place, but for sake of clarity and connectedness, I prefer to call it unfinished karma. What about the uh, instinctu instinctual power by which somebody like me who's so mired in words and rational thinking that I cannot do koan practice? It's not because of your instincts. It's, it's because of attachment to rational thinking. That's two different things. So that's not what's shutting, well, what am I shutting out? You're shutting out Sasha, that's the problem. But that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't understand what that means. <laughs> By blocking the greater reality, you're actually limiting yourself. Yes. That's why I'm saying you are shutting out Sasha. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't shut yourself out. Okay. I, I really don't even have a sense of how I would define um, use instinct in my whole reality but the term intuition sort of pops in so how are you using instinct what do you mean by instinct or can you define instinct in a better way than she can because you probably have a better eye handle on it that's not, you know no offense i don't want to define it any better than i have just said so because instinct is unfinished karma beneath your subconscious level okay or threshold but how does it manifest itself what is an instinct is it a okay. feeling is it an let's, idea let, is it let a... me give you an example then it helps everybody yeah okay. let's say that uh, you had a really tough situation and you had absolutely no money you were hungry you stole a snickers bar you didn't get caught but it was a relief from hunger and the experience goes very deep in your mind that actually that Snickers bar saved you from starvation and you got it by stealing. Your situation changes, you are already back in the, in the green, you have money, but when you see a Snickers bar still the memory comes up and the drive to touch it and lift it. So that's how the instinct, which is suppressed, comes back from your subconscious when you see the external prompt or stimulus. And if it becomes conscious and you let that come to you without suppressing it again, then you realize, okay, at that time I needed it. Now I don't need it. I don't do it. That's how you control the instinct. If not, the instinct controls you. Then you get caught. Is that different from habit energy? No, it's not. But okay. habit energy doesn't imply that it strikes from the subconscious. Instinct does. Habit energy can be conscious or unconscious. Instinct okay. is always in the subconscious. It's waiting. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. I just had a senior moment. I misspoke. It was intuition that I wanted to ask about. Thank God. I am much better <laughs> off with intuition. <laughs> so like I said, intuition is really the function of our true nature. When this clear mirror begins to reflect, and at first, especially as we practice gradually, this reflection is very simple. Sky is blue, trees are green, there's a bunch of people sitting in front of me. Moment to moment, reflect clearly without unnecessary thinking. And as we progress on the path, of course, at first, we start with our cognition. Nobody is without any comprehensive capabilities here. You can read scriptures. You can understand what I'm saying. So this is being smart, but it's cognition. It's not intuition. Yes. And suddenly, boom, it dawns on you that you misplaced your pen, and it's here, not where you thought it was, 
that's your intuition talking, connects with your memory, then it suddenly spotlight. You got it. Cognition gives way to intuition by sudden realization. Yes. And when you're breaking your brain, you know, you're wrecking your whole consciousness and it doesn't work and your intellect is in an overdrive. And suddenly you give up, there's a moment of no thinking, boom, your intuition has yes. space, then it works. Mm -hmm. Same thing with emotions. Many times people believe that intuition is like extended or enhanced emotional intelligence. No. It's also a function of your intuition to be emotionally intelligent, but they are not identical. It's a, like a relationship problem. You have a significant other and you just can't get through a difficult spot. You always fall back. And you cannot figure out how to relate to the person emotionally. And you become empty. And then you get a phone call from her and boom, immediately new speech appears, new vibes appear because your mind has changed. As you go on with your meditation, cognition, and emotion as karma, as patterns, give way to intuition because intuition is not pattern based. That's the difference between karma and dharma. It's not pattern based. It's not based on previous habits. It uses thinking, but it doesn't use cognitive patterns. So intuition uses your emotions as well, but it doesn't use your emotional habits. Big difference. And how you know that it works? The problem does not reappear. If you finish something, it doesn't come back. You can really look forward and go ahead. And you're not looking back because whatever is still your homework will come right in front of you. And if your intuition works, then the solution is complete. Then you don't have to work on it anymore. No leftover karma. I would like to ask you, in uh, today's world, it's, it's, it's never easy, but it's easier when we are in a place like this to attain our peaceful state of mind and try to find our consciousness, empty our, our mind. But when we go back to the world with all the challenges, stress, uh, situations that could sometimes be very challenging to get our reflexes, our feelings, our typical habits of behavior. What for somebody that is studying in this practice, what do you recommend to keep the peace outside? They should first observe how their cars work. And if they truly understand that they have to change the oil, they have to fill up the tank, and they have to take it to the serviceman, then it's not something out of the ordinary that you want to bring your mind back to this place. You want to come for regular practice. You want to have a cleanup, tune-up for the mind. If your car needs it, you need it. If your body needs it, your mind needs it. Very simple. So think about it as your own service station where we help each other clean our mind. All right, so it's, it's very, very natural that once you realize that we are responsible for the quality of our own minds, we do something about it. Very simple. That's why we need the great mechanic, the Buddha, the 84,000 volume service manual, the Dharma, and countless helpers, the Sangha, the other customers who work on the same thing. That brings me to my biggest problem is I have no barrier. Irritation is a big thing in my life. Okay. And I'm aware of it. But by the same token, when it pops up, I just blast forth as opposed to <laughs> stepping back. And I try very hard to tell myself, not at the time it happens, but I tell myself all day long, just step back, step back, step back. But as soon as it's in front of me, I'm boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you I have think any you're tricks? Doing very well. I look at your face, it's very peaceful. So I think your irritation <laughs> has a great integration <laughs> as well. I live with 220 people, seniors, and we just go at it all day long. <laughs> you seem to be winning. So. <laughs> no. Irritation has energy, okay? It's a sudden impulse of willpower. It's like an explosion of karma inside. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have uh, these gallons of fuel and you don't put it into the tank and it doesn't get to the engine, you just light it up on the roadside. It has a big boom, this flash, heat, 
light explosion, but it doesn't get you 20, 25 miles ahead. Okay? So impulse and irritation together, they are the overdrive of your willpower. So smoothen out your willpower, and when irritation appears, immediately turn your attention inwards and ask, what do I really want? So connect the impulse, connect the irritation to your willpower. That's your engine. And if you put that fuel into the engine, you can go very far. You have strength. But if the strength comes in this quanta of irritated moments, you waste it. Don't waste it. Put it to good use. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Ask the question, get to the root of irritation, and then you see that timing is everything. Maybe you timed your effort wrong. Maybe you are a little bit impatient. So wait until the right moment comes and then the effort brings fruition. Instead of banging at the door, you find a key. Wonderful. You open the door and then you go in. So willpower, if we do this right, is everything because we can get there. But irritation is like blowing up the gallons of fuel on the roadside instead of putting it into the engine. And you see that you're actually sabotaging yourself with irritation, impatience, etc., etc. I find that what's most rewarding to me, what makes me feel best, is being a bodhisattva to the extent that I'm able, helping other people. It, it satisfies me on many levels, uh, the least of which is it gets me out of my own uh, sense of uh, self-involvement. But uh, th there seems to be a, a, a problem with it uh, in its execution because once I start to feel like I'm uh, on that path, I, I tend to be too aggressive and uh, try to uh, foster my views on the person, well-intentioned or not, and it doesn't... Uh, uh, I don't have the desired effect. So I'm trying to learn how to moderate that uh, activity and uh, perform it to uh, my the best benefit of me and the people that I'm trying to help. Do you have any suggestions for me? Yes. Watch your mind. If you observe your mind clearly, the I appears, the bodhisattva disappears. You want others to believe your views, then you are a persuasive person, then you are an, an intrusive person, and at last you are an unbearable person. When all this appears, the I, my, me, the Bodhisattva disappears. The Bodhisattva has only one question, how may I help you? That's all. The Bodhisattva has limits. It's okay because it appears in a human form. Our bodies have limits. Our minds have limits. Connect this question to your previous question. You find that they complement each other very well. All right? So do what you can, as much as you can, to the extent you can. But when it's something you cannot do, join with other bodhisattvas. Because you will meet like-minded people. You can meet people who share your mind. And then you're not alone in your effort. Then you don't have to persuade anyone of your views. Because naturally there's someone next to you who is already doing the same thing or similar things for very similar purposes as you are. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Apart from sitting, can you recommend a way to be more reflective oh, before yeah. one acts? The original teaching with this great question, what is this, that I've quoted tonight, is like this. Whether you are sitting, standing, walking, lying down, silence, talking, moving, or completely still, constantly, without interruption, what is this? So this mind practice goes way beyond the form. And try to do this really in your wakeful time. Wake up with it. Stay with it throughout the whole day. And then when you go to sleep, you know, ask the question, what is this? And then just let go of the mind's humming 
and conscious activity and then take a good sleep for the night. So the great question actually never stops. It has two phases. One is the verbal phase. That's about six months, one year, depending on the frequency and intensity of your, of your practice. And then what you can see is that the question goes non-verbal. The question is there, but the sentence is not there. Mm. That's phase two, and it goes a long way, decades, and it goes deeper, simpler, clearer, all the time. There is no end to this practice. The other two methods that we use in our Zen school is the mantra practice, which has three important functions. One is that it sets your own priorities, your spiritual structure inside very clearly. The meaning of the mantra comes to the top of your own personal pyramid inside. So you recite a compassion mantra, that's what becomes most important for your mind. You recite the mantra of awakening, becomes the top of your personal totem pole. Okay, And this kind of internal hierarchy is very important in critical situations, in complicated situations, in tough ones where you have just one second to make a decision and that decision defines the next couple of years of your life. If this hierarchy is not clear, we get stuck. Our software has a glitch, screen of death, okay? You can't make the right decision, the moment passes, you were short, deficient, incomplete, and you feel it. That's why the hierarchy must be very clear. Next function of the mantra is it reduces the noise inside and lets the signal in. We've talked about that today from various angles. We'll mention that wonderfully. I tried to touch upon it, that if the noise inside doesn't decrease, the signal never increases, okay? And the third important function is that it protects the mind from its own harmful influence. Our own reactive thinking is our greatest enemy because we believe it. We believe in our making in our mind habits, in our prefixed ideas, in our emotional kind of hard set leftover karma, okay? We believe that because we identify with that. And out of that comes those reactions that create tons of fear and greed and ignorance. And that reactive mind is our greatest enemy. And we have it, we make it, we harbor it, we sustain it. So the mantra pulls the plug, okay? And it puts the energy to this cycle in the mind that has the other two beneficial effects that I have mentioned. That's why we also chant. We'll be chanting tomorrow as well. Short, like a sample, but it gives wonderful drops of clarity to your mind. So chanting is important, sitting is important. There's a third meditation technique, which seems like totally defenseless without any significant tool. And it's recommended for more advanced practitioners. Of course, anyone can try it, but there is no moderator between you and your karma. There is no mantra or question. You just sit, focusing on your Tantian, like with the other two methods also. But you only perceive the sounds and the space right here, right now. And the equation is very clear. If your mantra overpowers you, you lose this moment, and your mantra takes you somewhere else some other realm. You're not here, you can't hear the sounds. You can't hear the sounds of the cars passing in the street behind me. And if you're truly present and your karma doesn't control you, you are right here, right now, with a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, and you perceive the sounds. In fact, perceive the vibrations. Not just the audible vibrations. If you do this long enough, and you perceive other kinds of frequencies. And the precondition is you shouldn't attach to yours. Hmm. The moment you identify with your own thinking, you cannot really hear someone, cannot really see someone, cannot really understand someone else because your own thing, your own mind is more important. All right? So this is, again, the function of the great mind, which is no name, no form. No thing, no coming, no going, okay? So these three methods, they can go very far. There's countless other methods. But in Zen, we like to keep it simple. Why? 
If it's too complicated, then it doesn't work in a critical situation. The most critical situation is when we die. How much can you think when your body has almost no energy? You cannot have very, very complicated practices at that time. You have to have the habit of keeping your mind super clear at this moment, whether you are sick, whether you are dying, whether you are happy, whether you have people around you or not. Or none of this happens. That's why we want to keep it simple and clear so that it, it would work in any situation and under any condition. Okay? And uh, as method, this is plenty. It's enough for lifetimes. Because the fruition, the function of these methods is the way we live and die. The way we solve our problems, the way we love each other, the way we care for each other. It's a direct outcome of our mind quality. And I sincerely hope that from time to time we can come together, embrace the Dharma again, cherish each other's company again, realizing how important human life and existence is, and help each other attain enlightenment. No one can do this alone. And after a while, we realize no one should do this just for oneself. Either we help each other get this, or no one gets there, okay? This is not a competition. It never will be. Either we all get it, or none. So let's practice together as much as we can. Let's realize the path to the maximum possible extent. And for that, I want to thank you. I appreciate your coming today, your precious attention, and I hope tonight's talk will serve as an inspiration for further practice to come. Thank you very much.